emptied back into space. I'm now ready to start working in pen. I've decided today to work with three pens, an O2, which is the thickest line, an O1, one step down from that, and the finest line, O5. I'm going to reserve the O2 and O1 for those areas of the drawing that are closest to me. I'll switch over to the o 005 for the areas of the wall and gatehouse that are a bit farther back in the middle ground, and also for details within the object. And I'm thinking at this point about leaving the trees in the background just pencil. Um, I'll deal with that in, uh, with a little bit of watercolor in the bonus video, but um, by, by leaving minimal detail back in there, that will cause that to recede back in space. So, first thing I'm going to do is start working on the gatehouse itself. I'm going to establish the outer shape of that with the zero two. As I'm working this in, most of this has been mapped out in pencil ahead of time, but I still want to take the opportunity before I ink in these areas to look at the subject at the gatehouse and make sure that there aren't any errors or omissions that have skipped my attention up to now. We can continue to make adjustments and fine-tune our drawing right up to the point where we put ink to paper. The moment we've inked it in, we're pretty much locked in on that detail. There are some exceptions. After we finish the outlining, we're going to switch over to stippling, and I'm going to sh demonstrate for you how we can actually make corrections when we're doing stippling. A lot of people are almost frightened of working in pen and ink because of the fact that you can't erase it like you can with pencil. But if you're using something like stippling, you'll actually discover very early on that it's a very forgiving technique. And since it's additive, that, it, that being that we're adding value, darkness, as we add more stippling. You can always make an area darker if need be, or you can make it appear to be lighter by introducing a darker tone somewhere else in the drawing. I'll be demonstrating that for you briefly. Some of these edges actually will disappear into shadow, as you'll see once we start bringing in the tone. So what I do, rather than draw something in that I believe to be there, I'm drawing the underside of one of the beams right now, and I understand that beam goes over there and continues, actually meets another beam that comes in here, but I can't see that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
simply has that line fade off by simply switching it over to a broken and then dotted line. And then all of that will melt away. Okay, I've got enough here that we can go ahead and actually get started with the introduction. Now for the detail on the underside of that roof, I'm actually going to switch now to my 01, which is one step down in fineness. Dealing with a bit of breeze today. It's a distraction, but it's something that we can work around. I'm going to switch back over to the two right here to bring in the edge of the roof so that, that will be slightly bolder and that'll help to pop it forward of these details back in here. Okay, a word about stippling before, uh, as we get started with this. I'm going to switch over to the 005, the very finest point that I have at this point, to start the stippling because I'm testing the waters, so to speak. Uh, and the finer the mark, the, the less obvious it's going to be and the less problematic it's going to be if I decide to change my mind. The only thing that we need to decide right up front before we start making marks is where our highlights are. If we have highlights, we want to reserve the white of the paper for those areas. If you see an area, then take a look at your subject, identify where your highlights are, and reserve the white of the paper for that. At this stage, I recommend that you err on the side of caution. So for example, if you're not sure if an area is a highlight or a light middle tone, leave it a highlight at this stage. You can always, always go back and add more tone in this. And I'm using a very light stippling. I don't want to pressure the pen or anything like that. I don't want it to get darker by pressure the way I would with a graphite pencil. Instead, I want it to get darker by an accumulation of the dots. So the first thing that we're wanting to do is in an area that we know is going to be in some form of shadow, I'm simply getting rid of the white of the paper. One thing else I want to mention at this point is if you are trying stippling, especially if you're trying it for the first time, it's not a speedy technique. This is about observing, giving yourself the time to make accurate observations, and then to convey those more time that you allow yourself, the greater the likelihood that you're going to discover new things about your subject. One of the things I've discovered as I'm working on this is that as this area of the underside of the roof nears this peak, this side of the, the roof is blocking more and more light. We're getting less and less reflected light up in here. And so this is actually going to get darker. And that's one reason why these lines in here disappear as they come up in here. I'm going to give some indication of that right now. But eventually, I'll be switching over to the 01 pen, uh, pen to get a bolder mark, a, a bigger darker, juicier dot, and that too will help to move that in. 
By the time though I move into the zero one and then eventually the zero two, I'll be working smaller and smaller areas, just the, the core shadows, the darkest darks. If you don't find this technique fast enough for your liking, use a variation on it. This is very similar to the pointillism that the neo-impressionists were using in France in the, uh, the late 19th century. And among the advocates of the pointillist style, there were people who liked the idea but didn't like the time that was involved. And so unlike Seurat, they wouldn't actually use dots. They'd use short hatch marks. Vincent van Gogh, during his brief ex exploration of pointillism, used the hatch system. So you can use a short hatching Notice as I'm doing this, one of the important things about applying this is if you're af after a, uni for, or a uniform application in the area, try to avoid making your marks too linear. You don't want it to read as a line. You're wanting it to read as an area of tone. So you'll notice that I'm actually moving my pen around and trying, as best I can, to touch the paper with a random pattern. And you can also already see where just this small area that I've worked so far is really taking on a, a tonal nature. I should mention at this point too that before I started applying the tone within the lines, within the outline that I had already put in place, I took a moment to remind myself mentally as to where the light was coming from. This time of day, the light's coming from the right. So the sides over here are more or less in shadow. The sides over here are in lights uh, and everything. Um, there's a little bit of light that's hitting over on this side, so we also have within this middle tone, we have some shadows. So for example, right here underneath this cross section, not an architect, so I couldn't tell you what the, the term for that cross section would be, but across the, this cross section of the framing here, it's casting a shadow onto the wooden structure within it. So we have a slightly darker tone there and a more middle tone above that. Finally, as we approach the conclusion of the drawing, we want to, as in the second lesson, start slowing down a little bit. Spend a little bit less time drawing, a little bit more time looking at our subject. What we're looking specifically for are any areas that we haven't completed in the drawing, areas of tone that we've overlooked up to this point, or any tweaking that we need to do, fine-tuning to an area to bring the drawing to a conclusion.
Well, that's it for another week. I hope that you enjoyed our time together today and that you'll join me again next week for Back to Basics.